Hey, welcome back everybody to this final sub series of inheritance in Java. Uh, this will be part three. So the last thing I want to discuss is uh, overloading versus overwriting. And we've learned about overloading methods in our previous lectures. So if you haven't already, please check that out. When we talk about overloading versus overwriting, there's a there's a difference in terms of actually the terminology it does look similar but it's not okay so let's take a look at an example okay so let's take a look at some code here remember last uh, lecture we had the employee class which is the base right this is your base class and then you have your salary employee which inherits from employee what we're gonna do is we're gonna overload a method employee right now has a set name class right I mean set name method which is accessible by salary employee right and you can pass in a method I mean a, a string and then that would assign the name of the employee now in salary employee what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna overload the set name and what that means is I'm not going to redefine it. Remember, overloading means polymorphic, meaning many forms, meaning that with overloading, you're going to have two versions. You're going to have, the ver at least in the salary employee class, you're going to have the overloaded method called set name that has two parameters, uh, first name and last name. And then we're also going to have accessible to us the employee one, which is the plain Jane which you only pass in one parameter. In my set name in the salary employee class, I don't have the variable name accessible to me, meaning that I cannot do this. I can't do name equals first name concatenate with last name because name itself is a private instance variable. And when I inherit from a base class, I do not have access to the private instance variables. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the word super. Remember, super is, a, is the keyword that we use to access the, the base class, right? And we also can call super to access the base constructor, as we saw in, in the previous lecture. What we do is we say super dot set name, right? So we're going to access the base class name, except we're going to pass in the first name and last name that is coming in from whoever calls this two parameter set name. But in all actuality, what we're doing was just calling the base class and we're concatenating whatever they come in, right? So if I look at main.java, we have the salary employee instantiation here. We're going to set name with two parameters, right? So let me just get a little bit closer so you see what's going on. We have two parameters here, two strings. So this, in essence, is going to call the first. It's going to call the method inside salary employee, right? And then inside salary employee, we see that we call the space class set name, except we're disguising it because we're just concatenating the first and and second string. So if we print out the value of get name, you're going to get Billy Gunn, right? So let's take a look at that real quick. Um, you know, this thing has been timing out lately. I'm not sure why it always gives you that message, but hopefully you are all having a better luck than I am. Let's see. All right, so you see here that uh, the employee SE name is Billy Gunn, which is which is what we were expecting. Now, uh, when we look at the set name, you're going to see I'm actually going to have two um, available to me. Hopefully, this gives you the intelligence. So if I do that, let's see. Does it give you the intelligence? Um, no, it does not. Okay, that's fine. Um, usually, uh, we can click down and you can see which one to choose. So, um, this is the set name from the base class. So, we're calling it directly. 
This one calls it from the salary employee, right? Except that what if I was hiding this, right? And I was hiding the so when you when you package up a class, you're not going to see the implementation. But all I'm doing with set name on the salary employee class is I'm calling the base class set name, except I'm concatenating these both. Okay, but now you see how I've overloaded the set name method, one with one parameter and the other one with two, which is different, which is different than overriding. Right? If I was overriding the method, I would only have one version, and I would be overriding or de redefining the method, same exact parameters, and same exact number of parameters. Okay, so that's a good test question that they could ask you um, in terms of an interview, right? So they can ask, well, what's the difference between overloading and overwriting? So one, one statement you can make is that overwriting a method, you're redefining the method itself, okay? When you overload a method, you're creating a polymorphic representation of a method which means that you have many forms of that method. One with, let's say, for, for example, for just simple example, one with one parameter and the other one with three or two. Okay, so that's the type of way that you would answer um, that, that question. Okay, obviously there's, there's more, um, but again, uh, I'll let you find, find out other differences. But I think with that, if you understand that, um, I think that would be good enough, but then you'd wanna know when to apply it, right? So well, that's another question that they can follow up with you and they can ask, uh, so, well, okay, so you know the difference, but how would you apply it? And, and under what circumstances would you want to apply it? Uh, and there's millions of answers for that. So um, if you want more interview tips on that, let me know. I can just hit me up in the comments. I can answer. Okay. Okay. And I did promise in my last video that um, I was going to go over this um, example where we set the name of one object and then let's see if that other object gets the same name. So let's take a look at that real quick. All right, great. So remember last time we created an instance of the object, we're calling a constructor, right? So we're instantiating the object. We have an SE object instance and then we are going to call the get employee, right? And we're just passing in a dummy variable. And the get employee returns that specific object to SE2. Okay, and then SE2 now can can use the methods that are available to it. So we set the name, right? So we set it as Billy. And then I ask the question, okay, so if I set the name of SE2, what is going to be the value of SE? Because SE is my original salary employee, which I set as John. Okay, so if you said that SE will be Billy, you are correct. And I'll explain why. Let me draw a picture for you of how this looks and then Hopefully that will help you interpret the results. All right, so it's very helpful sometimes for me at least to look at code, right? So this line right here, okay, is creating an object in memory, right? So we'll call this SE, right? So all this is happening in the heap, okay? So SE is in a tangible object, it exists in memory, and it has the word it has the name John and the date and then the salary, right? So 2000. Great. Now we create another object, okay, called SE2, right? And we're assigning the reference, okay, the reference type. So the reference type is still salary employee. Right, so reference types match, right? So we can see that this is a uh, SE, capital SE, and this is also capital SE. So reference types match, right? This here, if we look at the definition of that, let's take a closer look at that. 
we're looking at this get employee method and we're saying return this now you remember what I said so this means that you want to return the current object okay so what's this in terms of the current object um, this is this thing here okay which means when I am doing an assignment okay and since this is returning the object the assignment statement when you're using objects is going to not make a copy of it but it's actually going to do a reference pointer to the object that you're assigning it to so again let me go back okay when we said return this right this means the current object that's currently instantiated in memory so remember se represents this box right here right we created that one with this line right if I said get employee I'm returning this box okay this box here that box in memory now in Java right we are creating a reference to that object which means that this represents this box right and we're saying okay assign that this to e2 and when in Java when you do that we're actually gonna say oh okay I'm not gonna get my own copy of se I'm actually just gonna point to it here okay so when I set name for SE2, okay, I'm actually going to use the methods that SE has, right? Which is um, you're going to set the name to Billy, right? So this becomes Billy. And remember that SE2 is now pointing to SE, right? and se any time that you change se2 then se is going to change okay because when you do an assignment statement on the object it's not going to make a copy okay so no copy okay this is what we call uh, so this is in terms of reference types you got to remember that classes are reference types which means that whenever you have an assignment reference types change only the pointer this does not make a copy if you had a value type okay such as an int or a double value types make a copy with classes and objects there is no copy you are just creating a reference okay an additional reference and you are going to share now you're sharing memory here sort of okay sort of uh, and then again whatever I change in se2 is going to be changed in se1 now you're probably asking well, why 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 are we doing like why is Java doing that I have my guess I and, and I think they explain this in terms of space right so when you are passing classes around on a function right so so far we've we sort of been passing things around that are uh, class types so reference types such as string right but let's say we created our own separate application and one of the methods needed a salary employee object to be passed around between a function we do not want to keep making copies of the object in, in terms of passing it around in a function because remember functions are stored in a stack and not stored in the heap so if you're storing functions in a stack you do not want to have too many copies of this because you don't know how big the salary employee object is going to be right so instead of passing the whole object as a copy right because remember when you make a copy you are going to copy every single property every single method with the data you're gonna just clog up your memory 
But if you create a reference, then you're not clogging up memory. You are just creating a pointer like I'm doing here. Okay, and that will save you a tremendous amount of space. And that's most likely why it does not make a copy. So be careful with this assignment because you are not, again, you're not making a copy. You are creating just a new reference pointer where E2 will now point to, uh, I mean, sorry, SE2 will point to SE. Um, and anything that changes over here is also going to change over here. Okay. Okay, so I, I did promise you that. So I hope you got you understood that answer. Um, if you want to know more, just let me know. Um, but you would have to just try it yourself and see what's happening in terms of the uh, memory allocations. Thanks again. Uh, on the next lecture, I am going to continue with the with the trend of inheritance and object oriented programming, obviously, and we're going to move on to polymorphism, more polymorphism in abstract classes. So we're going to go into laid binding the final modifier, the two string method, and finally the abstract class. I hope to see you soon. Take care.